grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Good Samaritan. That's even a, a part, of our, part of our laws. The Good Samaritan. You know the Good Samaritan law? Somebody uh, uh, stops to help somebody on the road, and uh, uh, in that process, somebody, uh, I mean, the, the person who was hurt uh, received some other kind of an injury or something like that, and it used to be that they could sue the person that had stopped to help. But now we have this Good Samaritan law that says, that, no, you can't sue them for that. Well, so it's a part of it. Everybody, if they know any parable at all, they probably know this Good Samaritan law, Good Samaritan parable. And, uh, well, it's, I, in fact, I gave the gist of it two weeks ago in my sermon, the last time we were together. Yeah, the Good Samaritan. What's the concept, as I said last time, is that God calls upon us to be neighborly. And the problem is, is that, well, you have this lawyer in the gospel lesson today. Lawyer. Now, that's not like the lawyers today. Uh, the law that they were the expert at was the law of Moses. And, uh, and they were experts at it. They not only knew the law of Moses in its detail, all 613 laws of Moses, but they had spent centuries adding to the other volumes that basically in their vernacular is with all the loopholes to get around all those laws. We've talked about them before. You know, the Corbin law, so they didn't have to take care of their parents. They could just dedicate all the money they should have to support their elderly parents. Uh, they dedicated the temple, but there was no penalty for not giving it to the temple. Uh, there was, you know, the law about not uh, conducting any work on Sunday. But if you... Uh, uh, if someone delivered something and put it in the window of your house, uh, you could, uh, you know, conduct that kind of business. Uh, today, it's, you, you see that even today in, in the uh, Jewish communities where they walk to church on the Sabbath day. Uh, there's several things about elevators. I think if somebody else punches the button, the bu punching buttons is considered work or something. I don't know. But anyway, you can't do any work on the Sabbath. But they, you got your loopholes that go around. It's just... Okay. Well, and he's an expert in the law, and he comes to Jesus because we had all these lawyers and scribes and Pharisees who had the same kind of a job, but they were pursuing tripping up Jesus. Today, it's, it's a kind of, you, they still do it to leaders. Oh, it doesn't matter what kind of leader you are. They, they keep feeding them questions that, that hopefully they'll have some soundbite that they can use uh, against them. And it's, that's what he was doing to, to, to Jesus. He was trying to catch him at something. And being a lawyer, he started off with the first thing, asking what's the, best, what's the greatest of the laws, of all the laws. And Jesus, always one step ahead of these very smart people. <laughs> and he says, well, how do you say and, of course, he gives the, the usual response. It's, it's, uh, today in confirmation class, we short it to uh, love. <laughs> love God, love man. Okay? But he used the, the, the more extended. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second is, as, as it same, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's great. All right. Jesus says, do that, and you're good. You live. Well, being a lawyer... He was kind of embarrassed because he didn't get an answer from Jesus. His ploy didn't work. And so to sort of uh, to justify himself, he had to ask the second question. If you watch the news and, and the interviews, uh, that happens a lot. When they get somebody, a, a politician or somebody that's being, talked, uh, being questioned and, and they give a, a really good non-answer, and they are even a direct answer, but that's can't make anything out of that. Well, anyway, that's what they did to Jesus too. And as they're going through, he says, uh, "Rabbi, so who is my neighbor?" <laughs> See, because I guess they didn't have a good enough uh, uh, writings on the loopholes of love your neighbor as yourself. 
See, they didn't define who our neighbor was. Because, see, I've got some neighbors that aren't very neighborly, and I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to be kind to them. See. And besides, is my neighbors, is that the people who live in front of me, uh, beside me, behind me? Uh, is that the people down the street? Is that the people in the next neighborhood? Who is my neighbor so I know who to love? That was the question. And that's what prompted Jesus to give this parable of the Good Samaritan. And boy, did he weave an incredible parable. If you, if you go through it as an analogy and just pick up every little piece, and you can go for volumes on this, on this parable. But basically, what was the content? Is that falls right in with the, with, the, uh, with the Old Testament lesson today when God was giving the people of Israel whom he had just brought out of Egypt and was, they were en route to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And God comes to them and what he says to them is, you're going to be my people. You are my people. I am your God. And we're going to be different than other gods and peoples. See, every people had their gods. Greeks had theirs, Romans had theirs, you know, Assyrians had theirs, Babylonians had theirs, everybody had theirs, everybody small, everybody had their own little gods, their own system of laws in relationship to that. It says we're going to be different. Today we call it the Judeo-Christian moral system, if you will, and the law system. They're based upon that. Our Constitution was based on it, Declaration of Independence, everything, based on Judeo, based upon God's guidelines. And God explained why he gave us that, because you're going to be different. You're going to be different than other peoples. You're going to, and he went through that, it's, I mean, he gave them instructions about farming, because it was all hand done in those days. And so when you had a vineyard and you went, and he says, when you're going out to harvest all the grapes, don't harvest them all. See? Because they didn't have fast food restaurants. And they had no way to, 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 during the daytime, there was no place to pick up anything to eat. And so leave something along the field, on the edge of the field for the tourists <laughs> or the other travelers who are coming by. Leave it for the grapes or the grains. See, that was one time the, the disciples, you recall, they got fussed at because the disciples uh, grabbed some of the grain. And see, because they were disciples of this Jesus of Nazareth, they were held to a much higher standard. But they did what everybody else did. They went by and they grabbed some grain and they, they rubbed it in their hand instead of in the grist mill. And, and, the, uh, and they uh, rubbed it in their hand so that the, the kernels came out of just the meat of the, of the grain, whatever it is, and they ate that. Well, scribes and Pharisees, watch it, says they didn't say the blessing. What they said, they didn't wash their hands. That's what they meant was they didn't say the blessing. But uh, they didn't, they didn't, they, did, they forgot to say the blessing. Well, that was all ritual. But that's how they got their snacks as they were walking along. That's how they got their sustenance and, and ate their meals. And, and so it's, it's, it's kindness to strangers. Other countries don't do that. They take everything out of the field. All the grain, all the grapes, everything, 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 everything. They don't leave anything for anybody because that's their business. Right? So the people of God, not supposed to act the way they did in, in Egypt, not supposed to act the way they did in Canaan. You may not realize this, but the people of Israel, when they went into Egypt, when they came out of Egypt, they were very common. They were not a highly developed culture. Egypt, Canaan, the highest. Israel, none. But he said, you don't pattern it after those guys. Do it this way. It wasn't a command of God, as I've been saying. This he said, this is how me and my people do. We're, we're paying attention to what we can do in our general processes to be 
hospitable, to be neighborly to the people walking by our fields. To all these other kinds of things, you know, that you do. This is how we live life out. Today, the devil's done a great thing because we've emphasized, we call it the commandments of God. This you do, this you do not do, or you go to hell. That's not what God put them out there. It was, here's the way my people live. This is what we do. And if you have trouble, I'll help you. I'll help you. And, and what Scripture says, because I don't see my children's sins. I don't see them when they don't do what I tell them to do, and they do what I tell them not to do. I don't see that because they're my children. And I sent Jesus to die on a cross to pay for this, all of their sins. Can God not see our sins? Of course he does. He just says, this is how I act in response to you. That's an important part because he calls upon us to be neighborly. And who is our neighbor? It's not the people in the neighborhood. It's the people who need us to show them mercy. Whether they're within the family of God or not. Whether they're outside your family or inside your family. Whether they're members of this congregation or not. It's to show mercy. That's what being neighborly is. And how do we how do we come by how do we develop this of being neighborly, being merciful? You can't. It's not in you to do that. It's impossible. Because you're a sinner. But God's done it for you and says, I will credit you as having done it and I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will strengthen you and help you to be neighborly, to, be, to see people who need to be helped and to help them. And it's interesting how that good Samaritan guy, he not only got actively involved at the moment as, a, uh, as an ancient EMT, He saved that guy's life. If nobody had done anything for that guy, he would have died there. But he not only went to him, and he had a first aid kit in his saddlebags, and he put oil and bandages, he fixed him up, and and gave him, you know, the the wine's kind of a sedative. He helped put him on his own donkey, And took him to finally where there was an inn. And then checked into the hotel with this beat up near death man. And and took care of him over tonight to make sure that he was okay. He, He got involved. He delayed his trip. Helped him overnight. And then when next morning, as he's checking out, he goes to the innkeeper and he says, Here's two denarii. Now a dark denarius is a lot of money. I think I've heard it said that, that generally speaking, talk about it as an annual income. And he gave him two years of average annual income, if I'm correct, my memory. And he said here, and oh, by the way, I'm coming back, and if you spend more than that, just let me know and I'll pay you. He was involved, not only physically with his time and talent, but... His money became involved as an extended work of himself. That, by the way, is the stewardship concept. Is that here at Messiah, here at church, wherever you go, here at Messiah, in particular, is that there's two parts. There's that part with your involvement and your contributions, but also your contributions are an extended of your work. And we've really gotten into that over the last 20 years because now we have, uh, there are things that, that uh, we, 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 we didn't want to do anymore. Like vacuuming during the week, like cleaning up the toilets, like cutting the grass, 
like painting, like doing this and doing that. So we hired people to do that and increased our budget to hire people to do all those kind of things, right? Well, your offerings, the presentation of your gifts are not only for the electricity and the heat and air conditioning and all that, but it's for missions beyond us. It's your labor that you're not there, you're here, so we use our money someplace else to do that thing. That's being neighborly to people all over the world who need us to be merciful to them. That says, because you're a different community. There's, there was, I, I don't remember the man's name, but it, I think he wrote a, uh, an editorial, a Canadian who wrote an editorial about Americans. Remember that one? And they said, Americans are different. Any disaster anywhere in the world, and Americans are going to be there to help. Long before the American government gets there. <laughs> because it's, because America was founded and developed for the first couple hundred years on the Judeo-Christian concept of being neighborly as a nation. And we have all, you know, a majority. It's still a majority of Christians in our nation. It may not be a Christian nation, but its people are by far majority Christian, claim to be. And still, that idea is different. Now, there's a lot of people that have a lot of other different kinds of ideas and feelings about America and its power and its, its projection into the world for this, that, and the other thing, and its leadership now or later or before or after or whenever kind of stuff. But they still recognize that if there's a problem, we're going to come and help out. Whether they abuse those gifts or not, whether they use them for what we give them to use them for for the people or not, we're there. That's being neighborly. That's the kind of community that God expected the people of Israel to be in the center of the Middle East thousands of years ago. But because they were sinners, just like we are, and we're, they lived amongst sinners, and we live amongst sinners, and that's why it makes it hard for any nation to be in to do that. Because sooner or later, the sinners are going to take over and destroy that which is good. Destroy that which was merciful. Destroy. Because that's what the devil does. And that's what people do. But you have God's little group. Except it ain't so little. In all the world. It's huge. Billions of people in the world. We know about that special relationship between God and his chosen people. And what God has already done so that his chosen people can spend eternity with him in heaven. Unlike all other religions or philosophies or theologies, there's only one real, true religion and philosophy theology. It's Jesus Christ. That's what Paul talked about. When, or was that here? That was at Sunday school. And he was on, oh, no, it was in the, in the dedication this morning. In the, in, the, in the blessing of it. When, what, you know, Peter, where Paul said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. By his death on the cross, our Lord won salvation for us. He said, it is fitting that this cross be sanctified by the word of God and prayer for our devotion and as a proclamation of his atoning work for us. So then we sang, lift high the cross. We lift the cross high in our lives by our loving neighborliness. Our loving mercy 
Not to everybody, but to people who need it. There are a lot of people seeking benefits, but they don't need it. They have the wherewithal. They have the gifts, the talents of God to meet those needs. Wasn't that what happened was that some years ago when they limited access to social services, says you get five years. You can take that five years any time in your life, but you get five years, that's it. There is no more. And within months, the welfare rolls were like cut in half or something. I don't know, because they all got jobs. We have a lot of people that are crying, mercy, 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 help me, help me, help me. I run them off all the time. All these con men coming in and seeking our money. I says, we're not set up to help people like you. Because, oh, we've already been to all the social services and the German time help. And the, yeah, because they know what kind of charlatans you are. And you're just wasting their money. Being neighborly, being merciful to those who need our mercy. That's what God has called all of us in being his children to do. It ain't easy. Because people are suspicious of us. What are your ulterior motives? You're for our national. Imperialist. They want to take us over. What was the phrase? We went in and kind of straightened things out in Europe. And the only imperialism was we asked enough land to bury our soldiers. People of God are merciful as God is merciful. That's where we learned it. We learned about God's love for us. And because we come to understand God's love for us, that's what helps motivate us to love other people. We are unlovable, but by God. That's our nature. God loves us. Sent his son to die for us. We are God's children. And he says, my children, this is how my children act. He sets the goal. We don't have to do it. But as God's children, we want to do it because we know how much God loves us and we want other people to know that too. And so we don't have to be described as a law. It's just the house rules, house guidance. This is what mama wants. This is what God, our Heavenly Father, wants. And he has given us the kingdom. We are inheritors of the kingdom. Live like it. Live like it. Till Jesus comes. Then you see what it's really like in the perfection of heaven. And you already own that. Because that's his promise. And he always keeps his promise. Those loved by God are being neighborly. And that's a peace. It surpasses human. We're different. And that peace keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Until he calls us out of this world to be with him in heaven forever. Amen.